All right, we're at part four of four of trauma-informed evaluation practices in special education. If you've been sticking with us so far, you've seen how we've gone through four questions. The first we covered this morning was what counts as trauma. Then we talked about what are trauma's general effects on students, on their brain, body, and behavior. Um, and then we moved on to what about this child in front of me that I'm evaluating? Have they been affected by trauma? And specifically, you know, we looked at how to assess uh, impact on educational or behavior performance. We looked at how to assess symptoms and exposure that are trauma specific, both with COVID and kind of non COVID cases of trauma. And right now we're going to assume, yes, let's say you've gone through evaluation, you've answered all these questions. Yes, they've had something that might count as trauma. Uh, yes, they have symptoms of trauma. Well, how do you fit that into the report? How do you make a decision about an actual child? And I think the best way to do this is probably through a case study. So we're going to go through a very long case study first that's a non-COVID case study. Then after that, I'm going to add a couple mini scenarios uh, that have to do specifically with COVID. And as we go through all of this data, I want you to be thinking about this as just a puzzle, right? We're trying to solve a puzzle. Trauma may be a really big piece, you know, maybe we spilled something on the puzzle and it's just affecting everything. That's sometimes going to be the case when you have someone who has, for example, like really chronic sexual abuse history. Uh, of course, that's going to color all the data. Maybe though, it's just one factor and it'll mostly impact your recommendations and not really any decisions about eligibility or disability condition. And then last but not least, sometimes it could be one factor, but it's exacerbating whatever disability condition is there, or it might be directly related. Uh, I don't want to say the word cause because it's almost impossible in psychology to track the cause of any one set of behaviors, but you know, maybe there is a direct correlation, for example, between some traumatic grief incident and uh, the development of really severe emotional and behavioral problems. That can be true, and we don't rule that out as someone who might be eligible. So let's be thinking about this as we go through this data. I also want to think about uh, the fact that post-traumatic stress symptoms or trauma and eligibility under a disability condition under IDEA or 504 uh, are independent. They are independent decisions. So someone can have post-traumatic stress symptoms but not meet criteria for disability. They could have post-traumatic stress symptoms and meet criteria for a disability condition. Or they might have no PTS symptoms and still have a disability condition. Think of it like um, diabetes. Okay, so some children have diabetes. They're served maybe under 504 or OHI. Or maybe they have diabetes and they also have a learning disability. They also have ID. That would be that purple category there where the positive positive, right? Maybe they have diabetes and they they qualify under another disability condition. And, you know, then you have to start thinking about, well, diabetes can affect your attention and your mood and all of these other factors. So now you've got a kind of another factor of your disability condition. It's not a rule out just because you have diabetes doesn't mean you don't have anxiety or learning disability. It could be exacerbating it. But I want to make clear that trauma is like that. It is not a, something we use to rule out eligibility under disability conditions um, defined by IDEA. So let's look at Jorge. This is a case we saw in our clinic at um, UHCL when I was a supervisor there for our clinical practicum. The school psych students saw this young man and gave me permission to use some of their work. Um, he was, I've changed some of these details of course, six-year-old boy in kindergarten. He was referred by a social worker, a really awesome social worker at a local family domestic violence shelter. Uh, for some of his behaviors and he this is really important he had a documented already reported history of domestic violence so we were not the ones digging around like CPS trying to figure out if he had been abused or neglected or anything like that right we had documents we had the social worker and we had the caregiver all telling us yes he has had this ongoing exposure to domestic violence pretty serious domestic violence that led to injuries um, so we had a, a pretty thorough history already now I know you may not always have that um, but as we discussed in part three, you can be most confident about this exposure piece and about doing this evaluation and trying to see how much this affected the child when you do have that documented exposure. We don't want to be digging around. We are screening for trauma with some of these measures, um, but it's just a screening. We're not going to, you know, if mom says no, 
we're going to say okay. <laughs> so this young man already had a reported history of domestic violence. Now this case I'm going to show you is like real life. It's pretty messy and it's not perfect, but it is um, a case where I think it's fairly clear that there were several things going on, so I wanted to show it to you. So just like any other assessment that we would do, we're going to use RIANT record review, interviews, observations, and testing. And in this case, we're going to go through, again, the impact, possible impact, symptoms, and exposure. And we're going to start backwards. We're going to look at impact because this is what these kids come to us with in the school, the data we already have. Remember, when we look at this child's impact data, we're looking for red flags in these categories, psychiatric disorders, lower adaptive skills, externalizing and internalizing behaviors, <clears throat> um, discipline referrals, suspensions, all of those behavioral outcomes. So let's talk about the R in Riot first. We went through records. He did at school in kindergarten have three discipline referrals already for excessive talking and running and climbing when he was expected to be seated. There were already two parent-teacher conferences requested by the teacher for his behavior. And um, we conducted interviews with the caregiver and the teacher. You should know that the caregiver in this case was primarily Spanish-speaking. We were lucky enough to have a Spanish-speaking um, psychology graduate student on our evaluation team. So she helped us out. Um, she was able to communicate with the, with the caregiver. Um, and you'll see that affects some of our administration of these standardized measures, which is another reason I wanted to show this to you because it's not always perfect. Um, so this is what the parents and the teachers said. They said that he doesn't always listen. He has a short attention span. He refuses to follow rules. The teacher said he's redirected four or five times every two minutes at school. You could tell this teacher's getting frustrated, right? Um, he annoys his peers on purpose, hums, makes noises during class, and sometimes if his peers don't pay attention to him, he'll start hitting them. Um, but he laughs like he thinks it's funny. And then he would have these kind of epic meltdowns at school where it was really hard for him to calm down, um, especially if he got in trouble or didn't get something he wanted. I'm sure this sounds familiar to many of you. All right, the O in riot observations. So as far as testing observations, when we tested this child in the clinic, um, he was really eager to please, sweet, sweet kid. As usual, you know, you always read these records of these kids and then they show up and they're like super sweet with you because they're getting one-on-one -on -one attention, right? But he was pretty distractible. He was climbing around in his chair, very talkative, you know, very, uh, you know, looking at the clock, looking at the phone, looking at we have a two-way mirror, so very obsessed with that. However, something important to note, especially for recommendations later, is that he did respond quite well to redirection from, especially from one of the team members who had taken the time to build a relationship with him. So again, for recommendations, you know, a couple elements there. Someone that he liked and had a relationship with was able to redirect him. Um, so that would be good for teachers at school to know about relationship building. And then he also responded really well to like rewards, which I know that reward processing is sometimes dampened in kids with, with a trauma exposure. Um, but he actually really liked like candy and stickers. I think at the bottom of it, though, it wasn't the tangibles. It was the attention from this person he liked. So, um, all right, we did a structured observation in the classroom. We went and visited his school. Compared to his same age peers in class, so a variety of peers that we chose to compare him to, he was being disruptive 27% of the time. And we use momentary time sampling. You know, you look up every 30 seconds, is he on task or not? Uh, or is he being disruptive or not? We define that disruptive behavior as uh, basically talking, um, interacting with peers when he was expected not to, getting out of his seat, anything that was kind of off task. Um, but you know, not necessarily just being just being looking off into space. This had to be something disruptive to the rest of the class. Um, his peers did these things about 7% of the time. So kindergarten, you know, some kids are doing that. But 27% versus 7% is pretty high. Uh, of course, in your school, you would be able to observe multiple times. We did not have that luxury, but we did have this data from the one observation. Some qualitative observations from uh, when we went to the classroom. He was really aggressive when his peers didn't respond. Again, he would laugh, but he would try to hit them to get their attention. Like that was his way of initiating contact. Um, they did seem annoyed a lot of the time. Um, he would get really upset, but it, again, for recommendations, his teacher would help him breathe sometimes, like breathe, let's take a breath, let's take a breath, and he would calm down. And then his teacher had to hold his hand, so that physical contact and one-on-one -on -one attention to help him stay in line 
Um, and I know you might be thinking like, well, we can't do that for every kid. Very true. Eventually we would like to scaffold this away. But again, for recommendations, like really good to know that he could, he was capable of kind of following the rules and everything with really heavy attention from his teacher. So we would want to fade that out eventually, but it's nice to know now while he's adjusting to school, especially in kindergarten. Okay, the last bit, T, right? So before we get to the trauma part, we're just looking at impact right now. So looking at testing, we did a BASC-3 with the teacher. And the parent, um, being that she was Spanish speaking, we did not have the Spanish BASC. Um, so we used the STQ, the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire. This is not like, um, you know, published by Pearson or anything like that, but it's one of the longest standing behavioral and emotional measures we have, um, especially in research. And there is a Spanish version. So we actually had, um, our Spanish speaking evaluation team member go through this with the parent. So we're trying to get as many sources of data as possible as always. Um, so you remember, or if you don't use the BASC, um, T scores have a mean of 50. They have a standard deviation of 10. I know you're probably like rolling your eyes like I know, I know, but um, this is actually taken from the slides we use to help the parent understand the results. Um, we remember that 60 to 70 is usually at risk and within normal limits is anything below that. So looking at his BASC scores from the teacher, look at all the red. Okay, this is clinically significant levels of externalizing hyperactivity and aggression. And the specific items she endorsed is like often, happening often or more, often or always, um, overly active, difficult to stay seated, trouble keeping hands and feet to self, speaking out of turn. Okay, what about aggression? Losing his temper, breaking other people's things, hitting children, defies parents or, sorry, teachers or caregivers. This is matching up pretty well with our observations. Um, again, you can tell this teacher is like getting pretty mad. Um, internalizing problems. So this is often overshadowed by externalizing behaviors because uh, it's hard to see like sadness and anxiety if the kid is acting out all the time. And of course we have a reaction to that. Like it's harder for us to be like, oh, I wonder if he's sad when he's sitting there breaking people's things in class. But there is some indication here that maybe some at-risk levels of like anxiety and depression. Anxiety will sometimes spike with kids with post-traumatic stress symptoms because post-traumatic stress is a form of anxiety. So look at anxiety. He's easily stressed. He's nervous. And we put sometimes in here to let you know, like these are not often or more. These were just sometimes gets very upset, um, depression, easily upset, cries easily, easily frustrated. And then somatization, which can be a big one with kids with PTS, especially with uh, younger children, remember, because they don't maybe have the verbal skills to say like, I'm very sad and angry. Um, he scored really low on this though, which we thought was really odd. Like never has stomach pain, never has headaches, never misses school because of sickness. I, we just thought that was interesting to point out to the parent. Um, so a little bit of a messy picture, as always, doesn't exactly match the ideal research profile of what you'd see in PTS, but I did want to include that because it's not perfect. And behavioral symptoms index, which as we know, covers all of the, the behaviors on the BASC, but just a couple that we haven't talked about. We already talked about hyperactivity and aggression, but looking at atypicality, um, sometimes says things that make no sense and act strangely. These are very odd, right? So we always follow up with an interview with the person who filled out the BASC, and I know that this time the teacher was saying like, yeah, he just goofs around and then, you know, acting strangely, sometimes he's just staring off. That can catch some of that ADHD type behavior. Oops, I said ADHD. We're not assuming he has that condition. Okay, so, but, um, but we're all thinking it. Uh, so we're next going to go to withdrawal. So he does have trouble making new friends. Ooh, poor social skills and peer behaviors, prefers to play alone and isolates himself. So is that, you know, more depression type thing or is it more um, poor social skills? Hard to see what's causing that. But regardless, he is having those symptoms of internalizing behaviors. And then attention problems, of course. Um, these were not as high as we might expect, but again, sometimes they can be overshadowed by the hyperactivity. So if you're being disruptive and hyperactive, you're also not paying attention. But he was easily distracted, having a short attention span and difficulty concentrating. Now, multiple people have reported this now. So here's the teacher saying it in a standardized measure. She said it in an interview. The parent has told us this. We have observed this. And um, even the social worker at the shelter has observed these things. So we've got multiple sources here. Um, now on the adaptive scales, again, we flip the scale. So higher is better on adaptive scales. Higher is, is less problematic. He did put peak some at-risk or uh, scores, 
for adaptive skills overall, and then adaptability, which is really coping with change. Only sometimes easily calmed when angry, so that's the outbursts, right? And then he has trouble calming down. Again, we learned earlier about body and brain and how it's hard to regulate after you've been upset. Um, and you might say, well, he's five, but remember, these are norm scores, so this is compared to other five-year-old boys. Um, doesn't transition well, very common for kids with behavior problems, but also for kids with PTSD and only sometimes adjusts well to changes in routine. Social skills, he's sometimes doing some of these things, maybe not at the level we'd expect. Well, actually, I take that back because 43 is in the average range, so it is at the average range. But I think the team wanted to point out here, like, he's sometimes doing these things. It's great that he's sometimes doing these things, um, but maybe those would be good anchors for intervention later of, like, trying to build up those skills to offset some of the, some of the problems or some of the difficulties they have. All right, so again, the parent um, was unable to fill out the BASC, so what we had her do was we had someone go through the Strengths and Difficulties questionnaire in Spanish with the caregiver. And so you can see that the total score didn't really raise any concerns, strangely, even though he does have some very high hyperactivity, very high impact. So again, these are the same kinds of symptoms, restless, um, temper tantrums, fighting with other kids, you know, she's reporting lying and cheating. That's more common to see that sort of stuff at home, so like ODD type things. Um, however, that wasn't like her dominant complaint. We didn't see that across settings. Um, and just the, the constant distraction, being restless, overactive. Um, and then just like on the other measure, she is saying he sometimes is helpful for up to others and he has some prosocial behaviors. Um, her impact score is like very high. Like he, she, I mean, she's like, yeah, this is definitely affecting us at home. Okay. So some slightly lower prosocial behavior, but not in the red yet. Um, but again, matching up. Now, uh, the emotional symptoms, interestingly, um, the caregiver didn't endorse many or any of those. Um, so that's stuff like depression, anxiety. Um, we know that parents are better reporters than teachers of internalizing problems, but the best reporters are the kids themselves. And since he can't tell us yet, because he's five or six, um, that gets really difficult. So I think that's one of those things where uh, she's going to have to continue to monitor. Um, also, I wanted to say that just like at school, at home, sometimes behavior can mask some other emotional problems, or, you know, the other hypothesis is that he doesn't have any emotional problems at all. Um, let's look at his ad academics. And again, these were the red flags we learned about in earlier discussions about kids with post-traumatic stress and looking at their reading and math scores, you know, their absences, retaining grade. So he didn't have a ton of absences. He has not been retained, um, though he had some kindergarten readiness testing in his records. Um, that showed below expected levels and also some unsatisfactories or unmet um, on his report card. And this was just from kindergarten. By the way, this is spring of kindergarten year. I should have said that earlier, but it's spring. So the teacher's very frustrated by now. She says that he's just not getting it in class. Like she has to repeat herself. He's not listening, but he's just not really understanding a lot of the concepts. Observationally, like he's just not engaged with the schoolwork part. Like we saw that in class, we see, you know, he's raising his hand, not really you know, giving the right answers. He's joking around. He's not really participating. He's busy hitting others and getting up. And um, we did a little KTEA. His scores were, you know, fairly low average, 88 listening comp, 87, 90 for reading and 95 for math comp, 86 math concepts and applications. So, I mean, these scores are not terrible. Um, maybe there's some impact there, maybe not. The clear thing is that like those kindergarten readiness scores, the unmet, him not being engaged, and then those behavioral elements, um, those are all big red flags that there's definitely some educational impact. Even if some of these KTA scores, you know, don't qualify him for, let's say, a learning disability, there is enough educational impact, I would say, and behavioral impact at school um, to warrant further investigation. So what about cognitive scores? This is just, again, I mentioned this is not diagnostic for kids with post-traumatic stress. But we gave him the WIPSI-4, and we only gave certain subtests. He actually bombed. Well, he didn't bomb. He didn't understand block design. He kept messing with the blocks and everything. So we actually, um, that test, we considered it spoiled, and we did not include it in his full-scale IQ because he got like a 1. Um, but it was really not fair to score him on that as a floor effect. Well, maybe. Um, 
so if you look at, he has mostly average scores on most of these subtests. Bug search, similarities in picture memory, and matrix reasoning, all fairly average. His full skill IQ was a 90. Um, so a lot of average scores clustering there. You know, he had this um, particular strength in object assembly, which again, just anecdotally, all the kids I've worked with with post-traumatic stress, not all of them, but a lot of them tend to have this visual spatial strength. I don't, I guess it's, um, you know, um, I'm just always really curious about that. But information, which is a verbal subtest, you can see that's way below, you know, and you might be like, well, was he paying attention? Um, I think he was distracted for most of the test, so I don't know if he was any more distracted during verbal items. Um, his verbal comprehension index, that did pull it down below 85, which is concerning, um, but similarities he did fine. So we, you know, we kept him really engaged during that. He was able to point out similarities. Think about those items at that age level, like it's about fruit and very tangible things. He did quite well on that. Information is a little more open-ended. You have to generate words, you know, it's pretty tough test. Um, and remember also that he's in a Spanish speaking household. So though he is not, uh, he, his primary language is English, not Spanish, but his caregiver is primarily Spanish speaking. And so sometimes that might have an impact too. So let's throw another factor in there, another wrench in our system, right? But regardless, our conclusion for this little guy was, you know, overall, when you're six years old, IQ scores are not terribly stable. He has these attention problems throughout the whole test. You know, one of the tests was spoiled. He's very young um, and he's, the majority of his scores are in this average range. He did have a coherent like full scale IQ that we were able to say was 90 average range. So we're not suspecting any type of learning disability, which I wouldn't diagnose or wouldn't qualify him for in a six year old anyway. Um, but probably not intellectual disability, right? With a 90 overall. So this is good that it told us like he may be having some trouble verbally and again verbal is one of those areas that PTS symptoms or post-traumatic stress symptom yeah that's not redundant um, can affect but we're pretty confident that IQ is okay. So we have impact we looked at our cognitive we looked at behavioral we looked at academic now let's look at actual trauma PTS right and we're still gonna do riot. Let's look at exposure first. So we did not have the UCLA because this was a couple years ago in the spring and it had not come out yet. We only had, uh, this is called the North Shore. The full name is the North Shore Long Island Jewish Health System Trauma History Checklist and Interview. This is what I was trained on in Memphis. Um, it's basically an interview with a child, although this child wasn't old enough. So we use, um, we interviewed the caregiver with our Spanish speaking team member. Um, I want you to notice in the report we would say that we administered this measure, and this would be a very similar blurb to what we talked about earlier for the UCLA. UCLA. Given history of exposure to domestic violence that was already reported in records, so remember, R of riot, we already have records saying that there's exposure. And I want to be specific about why we administered this, because or else it's like, why are you just poking around? You know, I mean, we're giving the COVID one to everyone, but this would be just, why are you poking around, right? Well, there's a reason we gave this, and we're very specific. Um, the interviews with the parent, we also say that like that's where we got this too. Now, you might say, well, why give an exposure measure? You already know about it. Well, a couple reasons. You might get a little more detail about it. You want to confirm. And, and in this case, we're going to have some like age of onset, maybe some duration. And we also have to get her in this case to clarify what the index traumatic event is, right? So in the report, this is how it was written. In, res in reference to her experience, to the child's experiences, Miss, parent name, endorsed him experiencing several potentially traumatic events in his lifetime. You can copy this right from here, even with, with the UCLA, including, um, and so these are all the ones she said yes to, and you have the ages there, neglect and physical abuse at one. Um, this child happened to move out and with another caregiver and where he saw domestic violence for a long time and before they moved to the shelter and then being involved in a major natural disaster, which you can guess what that was, um, when he was three a few years ago, or Harvey, okay. Um, then we asked her to identify what she thought was the most distressing. Now, again, if this child was older, we'd be asking them. I would say probably seven or above, but this kid is kindergarten, so we're gonna ask the parent. Witnessing domestic violence, she identified as the most significant traumatic event. And with that index event, we're going to go ahead and look at the symptoms. So, Again, we didn't have the UCLA, but this is pretty much the same idea. The CPSS 5 um, caregiver version is um, 
almost exactly like the UCLA, it asks about those symptoms in the different categories. So intrusion symptoms are re-experiencing. He only had one. She didn't report any avoidance, altered cognitions and mood, altered uh, arousal and activity. He had two of those symptoms, okay, which some of that hyperactivity probably keyed in there. And functional areas, she said no. Um, so like that asks, you know, does this interfere with you doing schoolwork, praying, everything like that. Interesting that she had put that because on the bath she said that the um, disruptive behaviors were impacting him a lot, excuse me. Um, so you can see how the parent conceptualizes this. I think this is interesting. Note that the parent or the caregiver um, had a lot of trauma herself. So sometimes we see this where, um, if, you know, let's say the caregiver is numbing out or whatever, they don't see it in their child or they're dealing with so much like they don't see this in their child. All they know is that there's these behaviors that are rising to the level where they want it taken care of, right? Of course, of course they do. Um, but it's, I think, interesting how caregiver has conceptualized this little guy when teacher and social worker are both saying, like, also we're seeing all this post-traumatic stress type behaviors. Um, well, not a ton, but at least a few. Total severity score was three. So on this measure, on the UCLA, there's a cutoff of, I think, 21. On this measure, 11 would be like there's significant symptoms there, kind of that mid-range, like at risk, mild to moderate, whatever you want to call it. 15 plus is really the cutoff for kind of referring for full evaluation for PTSD. So this kid had a few symptoms um, on the CPSS endorsed by the parent. Now, we were not sure that she completely understood this. It was very unstandardized. We administered it via interview in Spanish. So because of that, we want to get some collateral information. And we also administered the trauma symptom checklist for young children to the social worker. Um, this is a pretty comprehensive one. It's less than 20 minutes, but they actually, uh, you can do it online, of course, and they fill out multiple symptoms in multiple categories that are similar to the ones on the UCLA and the CPSS that we just saw, but pretty long. The, the thing I actually like about this, if you ever have a kid where you really need to get into the nitty gritty of the symptoms, um, it is standardized. It's only a sample of 750, but it is standardized and you get standard scores. Um, it was published in 1999, so it probably needs to be updated, but ages three to 12, Beyond 12, um, they have the TSCC, which is kids self-report their own symptoms instead of the caregiver. Um, John Briere, who did this measure, is awesome. He's one of the like kind of developers of a lot of the awesome trauma treatments like ICTCA and some other big ones. So on this one, again, he's not hitting every category. She had not really the same areas as mom. So intrusion re-experiencing, she's not seeing that. I'd be interested to go back and reread what mom specifically was talking about when she talked about re-experiencing. Um, avoidance, she's seeing avoidance. So I think probably a social worker does some counseling with the family and tries to ask them about events. And I don't know, maybe she's counting that as avoidance if he's not wanting to talk about it, though he's sick, so that's hard to figure out. But she does, um, she and the caregiver both describe situations where this little boy would see someone who reminded him of one of the um, alleged perpetrators of his abuse in the grocery store, and if he saw people that looked like him, he would run and hide. So that's definitely behavioral avoidance. Um, the arousal is not high on here. Um, it's, you know, mild. It's not even in the range of potentially problematic for this measure. Um, but dissociation is high, and sometimes dissociation can look like inattention and vice versa. In fact, I mean, they're neurologically sort of indistinguishable, right? Like, if you're not paying attention, is it because you're kind of dissociating? Inattention is a form of dissociate. You're dissociating from the task at hand. And, of course, anger and aggression were pretty high. She didn't endorse anxiety or depression. He's six, so it's kind of hard. But... Um, I do want to note the dissociation on here. Um, there is a version of the scale that includes sexual concerns. So if that's part of it, um, I always kind of advise schools not, there's a version that doesn't include that. And I would probably go with that one because explaining high sexual concern scores without any sexual abuse is kind of interesting. Um, and kids can spike that. But for dissociation, um, I wonder if this has to do with his inattention. Uh, but yeah, so dissociation, a lot of people, like they watch these movies like Split, and they're like, oh, it's dissociative identity. No, like any dissociation is just like you're kind of mentally avoiding something. You're you're feeling separate. You're not paying attention. You're you're disconnecting from the task, right? You're disconnecting from whatever the focus is. You're feeling kind of, you know, it's an avoidance strategy. So a lot of us do that. We dissociate every time we drive to work on autopilot. 
and that's dissociation. Um, so this is just a matter of how severe is it and how problematic is it in the person's life. But I did want to point that out because sometimes people will see dissociation, especially school-based professionals, and they're like, what? <laughs> like multiple personalities? No. So this kid is maybe having some dissociation or inattention. So we have a lot of data now, and of we had more than this in the report, um, nothing really life-changing, but we have a lot of data from different sources, different formats. We have records, interviews, observations, and testing from a lot of different people in this child's life. So now comes the hard part, the decision, right? Now I know that we don't diagnose ADHD in schools, but it is one of the more common contributors to school behavior problems, right? And we do have an OHI category that's like sort of, kind of, ADHD would fit there well. So let's look at, there is a very um, large, not large, it's emerging, a, a, an emerging literature on the overlap between ADHD and kids with post-traumatic stress symptoms. We think that right now, based on neurological evidence, the brain pretty much looks the same regardless of whether it's caused by ADHD or caused by traumatic stress. It's that knocking the regulation system offline, being very hyper and aggressive. Um, you know, the difference is that ADHD is neurodevelopmental, is very, very highly heritable, like 50 to 80% um, heritable in populations and it is not as environmentally caused, though it can be exacerbated by environmental factors. ADHD and traumatic stress as diagnoses share a lot of overlapping kind of characteristic behaviors. That hyperarousal, which could be hyperactivity, it could also be arousal. Again, it's pretty indistinguishable in the brain. Um, that impulsivity, making impulsive decisions, impulsive actions, some aggression sometimes because of the hyperarousal and the reactivity. Um, and then some difficulty concentrating, maybe because of dissociation and traumatic stress, right? Your brain's knocked offline. Attention-seeking behaviors, what parents and teachers would describe that way. Social difficulties because of these things. Probably um, some sleep problems, though in traumatic stress it might be related to actual anxiety, whereas in ADHD it might be related to just like the brain not turning off. Oh wait, hey, that's the same thing. See? See? Your brain is the same no matter what you're actually... Um, so some sleep problems, which we know like sleep, oh gosh, sleep, if you could cure everyone's sleep problems, I think that we would have like plummeting levels of all mental health problems. It's amazing. Um, there's a book out called Why We Sleep, which is really interesting about that. And then low self-esteem, probably because of repeated, you know, failures in different domains of life because of all these things. Now on, on this bubble, the ones that are in bold are the ones that this child showed. Um, and so... Well, I'd actually say that he was showing more than the bolded ones, but these were the ones we had definite evidence for hyperarousal, impulsivity, and aggression, evidence across like ratings, across reports, I guess, because only some people said he was attention seeking and had social difficulties. Um, on the traumatic stress side, y you know, you're looking, well, what caused it? Is it neurodevelopmental or is it traumatic stress? You're looking more at like, was there a traumatic incident, right? If there is none, that's easy, then maybe it's ADHD. Um, but market accelerations in arousal and reactivity. So kids with ADHD might be turned on high all the time, but in traumatic stress, it's like that kid that goes from zero to 100 in a few seconds, right? Um, and then the symptom clusters, re-experiencing or intrusion, avoidance, negative alterations in cognition and mood, irritability, shame, guilt, fear, helplessness, dissociation, withdrawal. So this kiddo had definitely arousal and reactivity problems. Some people report avoidance, but not everybody. Um, we're not sure about the guilt and fear. One person di reported dissociation, but not everybody. Um, and then look at the ADHD side. So hyperactivity, difficulty controlling behaviors, difficulty waiting tur their turn, talking excessively, interrupting others, difficulty following instructions. Okay, we have a lot of data for this kid for all those things. Um, losing things and then inattention. Again, some people said he was inattentive, some did not. I would be willing to bet that if he does have ADHD, as he gets older and goes up in grade level, the inattention may become more um, salient, if it's there. Okay, so we look at this, right, and we use all of our riot data, and we kind of say, you know, there's a lot of overlap. This is not perfect. It's definitely a gray area. Like, of course, mental health conditions or neurodevelopmental conditions or educational conditions do not have this nice black and white, like, boxes, right, like we wish they did, but this can be helpful to kind of plot out 
Um, I mean, I made our students literally plot this out, like sit down multiple times and start putting in the data in these decision matrix, like in these decision matrices of like, what's my evidence supporting ADHD? What's my evidence saying no? And then independently, what about traumatic stress and ADHD? There is some overlap, so we do need to look at that. So look again at the ADHD criteria. These are all the ones that multiple people and multiple sources, multiple methods of assessment showed us that he had, he was exhibiting. Just looking at those for a minute. This is direct wording from the, the DSM-5. And this is a hyperactive impulsive type. Again, I don't know that they're reporting enough inattention at high levels to be considered combined or inattentive type, but definitely that hyperactivity. Okay, so he's looking like he kind of has ADHD, but there's no doctor's not saying he does yet. He doesn't have a diagnosis. He's very young. Um, what do we think? So this is what we concluded. Given his past exposure to domestic violence, Again, we're over and over saying why we did this, right? We're not just saying like, well, we just feel like we should give this for fun to check it out. Um, we measured trauma-related symptoms. A lot of the behaviors like hyperactivity and distractibility are often seen in children with post-traumatic stress and also in children with ADHD. So we're highlighting that overlap. Data from the current evaluation indicate that he's currently experiencing some, and what we call subclinical, you can use whatever word you want in the schools, right? Some post-traumatic stress symptoms, you know, unclear whether they're interfering with his functioning right now as much as uh, the clinically significant symptoms we see across the board that are more consistent with ADHD. And again, depending on your district, how you word reports, you may not say that, but you may say, you know, conditions such as ADHD or disruptive behavior conditions. Um, and then you're also going to throw in that OHI language in here if that's what you're going for. You know, again, not to jump to conclusions, this child, I made our students look at, elig uh, look at possible considerations. They're not deciding eligibility. We actually went to the school meeting for this child after we did our report and they were awesome. Like the principal um, sat down with us, took all of our recommendations really seriously um, and we talked through with them what that we thought would be most appropriate but of course we didn't make the eligibility decision. In the report we suggested considering 504 and OHI um, because of the ADHD symptoms but I wonder too like looking at ED criteria, you know, if this child was a little older or had a little more internalizing and externalizing symptoms, I just wanted to throw out there um, that you don't have to have depression or anxiety to have ED, right? Inability to learn that can't be explained by other factors, mm -hmm, maybe. Inability to build or maintain satisfactory interpersonal relationships with peers and teachers. Um, I think he probably definitely meets this. Inappropriate types of behavior or feelings in our normal circumstances. Again, the ED criteria, as you know, is like I will these have nothing to do with science or anything. They're literally made up by legislators. But, okay, like he could actually fall into ABC a little bit. Um, it might not be the most appropriate category, depending on what your team decides. Um, pervasive mood of unhappiness or depression. We're not seeing that. Physical symptoms or fears associated with personal school problems. Um, this is where some kids with PTS might definitely fit. This kid, maybe not so much. He's not seeing, we're not seeing that like high anxiety level. But physical symptoms or fears, I could see in other kids that have PTS, like considering all those body and brain effects, right? Um, so like the stomach aches, headaches, fear, anxiety associated with personal problems. Uh, you could consider trauma a personal problem. So um, it includes schizophrenia and it doesn't include social maladjustment unless it is determined they have an emotional disturbance. Okay, social maladjustment I know is a whole other like Pandora's box to open, but I want to point out that trauma does not count as social maladjustment. Social maladjustment is usually interpreted to mean things like, you know, stealing drugs, like illegal means. And the history of this is so ridiculous um, of why it's included in ED. And you can read about that. But suffice it to say, like, you cannot use trauma to say, well, he's socially maladjusted because of trauma. We had some people in Memphis, like some schools that would send us reports back and be like, well, we, he, we can't help him or we can't evaluate him until he gets help for the trauma because that social maladjustment is like affecting our ability to tr assess what's really going on. Well, I'm here to tell you that, you know, trauma is probably part of what's really going on and it's exacerbating some of the other symptoms. You can't purely separate it out like that. Okay, that's just my mini rant on social maladjustment, but... Um, just because they have trauma doesn't mean they're socially maladjusted. If a kid meets the criteria for something, they meet the criteria for something. Like these, our criteria are not saying anything about cause. If a child with trauma has some of, has these criteria checked off, then they meet the criteria for ED. Like your team can decide that. Um, you don't have to, 
use trauma as something that's like somehow not part of this. In fact, I would argue that almost all of us have some kind of little t trauma that contributes to, you know, if you have a problem like this, one of these issues, part of it, yeah, is underlying vulnerability. But again, I would argue that life events, traumatic, stressful events are what brings this out in people. So ED and trauma overlap quite a bit. Okay, but not for this kid. Okay, we gave him maybe more considerations about 504 and ADHD, which is pretty common. Um, when you, we went to make recommendations, I want you to just think about two general things for trauma. If you have significant trauma symptoms present, so people who are spiking 21 or above on that UCLA trauma screener, they need to get therapy specifically addressing their trauma symptoms. Okay, they're not probably just going to go away with a few accommodations. Um, TFCBT, ITCTA, so trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, um, integrative treatment for complex trauma in adolescents, John Breer, the guy that did one of those measures we just looked at. There, These are all evidence-based uh, treatments for trauma symptoms. Um, I'm certified as a TFCBT uh, national therapist, and there are many people in our area who are the CAC downtown. The Child Advocacy Center keeps a referral list of therapists in the area who are willing to do trauma treatment. So they're a really good resource. You will likely refer, refer out for this unless, uh, like I said, like SciFair or something where you have a huge psychological services unit, you're likely going to need to refer out. And like I said, there are plenty of people in our area who do this kind of treatment. Um, we're doing all telehealth right now. So um, a lot of people are, even if they're not in the media area, they can do trauma treatment with these kids. Um, the other thing to consider is they're going to need wraparound recs. This is not just going to be like, okay, go get your treatment and, you know, but kids with significant trauma, um, they're going to need stuff for their school, their classroom, family home, and outside agency involvement. This is, you know, kind of the cradle to grave, like this big, you're making a nest for the child. Um, so even in cases where the post-traumatic stress symptoms are kind of lower, we know a kid like this, who's been exposed to domestic violence and abuse and all this stuff, like, I mean, maybe he's just like the most resilient kid ever, but even those lower levels of reported symptoms, which we're going to talk about reevaluating later, they're going to affect him in all settings. So we're going to need recommendations for all of it. Um, here's what they recommended in their report for this guy. Um, some problem solving skills to help with social skills, social stories about expectations at school and how do you get other people's attention, you know, some really explicit social skills training which can be done at school. Um, behavior charts or daily report cards, which is kind of the go-to ADHD intervention, right? Teacher and caregiver keep in contact about what's going on at school. He gets rewards, maybe maybe consequences, but probably start with rewards, probably more social rewards for this kid. We know from how he um, behaved during the testing and what he was responsive to. And oh my gosh, most important thing for kids with exposure to trauma, structure, 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 routine and consistency. So really important to coordinate across settings, across caregiver, teacher, social worker, that routine, routine and ritual for kids with trauma. Remember that they're used to living in a really um, unpredictable environment and they have a lot of uncertainty and a lot of their behaviors are defensive against that. And so if you can provide routine, it might provide a sense of safety for those kiddos. And that's kind of the foundation. You're not gonna be able to work on any of these other like social skills, anything like that until you have that foundation of safety and relationship. Speaking of which, relationship building, explicit relationship building. There's a school I saw in California that has like time time with the principals. Like the principals come eat lunch with the kids every once in a while and really sit down and get to know them. You know, getting to know the kids and the staff and the teachers as people. Like really making an effort to build a relationship with these kids. Okay, and at school they recommended counseling services. Of course, if the child doesn't qualify for special education, that is going to be difficult. But... Um, maybe there's a group, a social skills group you can send the kid to. And again, you could probably, you could refer out for counseling services. Um, the shelter they were at did some family counseling, so that might be good for now. Uh, he doesn't really have direct uh, trauma symptoms now, but keeping that on the radar. Um, definitely behavior intervention plan, positive behavior supports for this kiddo. He is like prime target, prime um, candidate for a BIP to go along with all of his other stuff, which you don't need special ed for, so... Um, as you know, so he can have a BIP regardless of what category he goes under, if he's eligible for IDA. Um, and then, oh, huge monitor the symptoms, okay? A lot of times what happens with these kids is, like I said, the behavior is really living large, and so we don't see other symptoms until later, 
when they start to coexist with the ADHD or maybe the PTSD and ADHD and behavior stuff causes him to fail in school. He doesn't have many friends. And then you see him as a teenager and he's depressed and has low self-esteem and starts, you know, using substances because he's had difficulties in all areas of his life, you know, and not a lot of support. So we're monitoring this constantly. Um, in the clinic, we always recommend that these kids get reevaluated much sooner than every three years. Of course, I know in a school that's not going to happen, but, you know, um, we would encourage like the social worker to help the parent get evaluations for these PTS symptoms. Maybe not full evaluations, but just someone to monitor and we'll give them like rating scales, you know, fill this out with your doctor every once in a while. Keep looking at this because if they spike, it's going to shift the, the recommendations. You're going to need a different treatment. The other thing is with kids um, with post-traumatic stress, uh, things like IQ, achievement, all those things are variable in little kids, like let, regular little kids, let alone kids who have been exposed to trauma whose variability in scores can be huge. So we know that 90 is like he can at least do a 90 full scale IQ. He might get better. In fact, this kid, when we took him to the school meeting, the um, principal was like, well, we're going to play, we plan to test him for GT. So he's probably maybe capable of doing more. Um, um, and then reevaluate this whole question of PTSD versus ADHD, though we know it's not like either or necessarily, but what's, you know, what's really behind this? Is this that he already had ADHD, which by the way, there's no family history of this. So my hunch is that it's really post-traumatic stress looking like ADHD. Um, after a while, a period of stability, like months to years where he's been out of the shelter with caregiver, they're living at home, you know, some stability that's going to be hard to get, but let's say that he has some period of stability. If the ADHD symptoms are still there, then I'd be more confident saying like, yeah, this is a neurodevelopmental issue. He would have had ADHD anyway. This just exacerbated it. However, if a period of stability goes by and the ADHD symptoms subside, I would think it is more likely that they were caused or exacerbated by post-traumatic stress. We see this a lot in foster kids, kids who get adopted, they get into a stable home and all of a sudden they don't have ADHD anymore. Oh, magic. Okay. Um, so reevaluating is really key in monitoring. As you saw on the UCLA measure, like one of, you know, every single category says continue to monitor, continue to monitor. We're pretty good at that at school. Um, there's an SOS book that's behavioral based, behavior based, like behavior modification, behavior management strategies for parents. And our awesome Spanish speaking team member found the Spanish version. I thought this was a great recommendation for the parent. Um, we also recommended some kind of behavior parent training. We happened at the time before COVID to do that at UHCL, so we invited her to come to that. And then um, something that I was trained on too was parent inter parent child interaction therapy or PCIT. Uh, that's an evidence based treatment that helps stop further abuse. Actually, it helps improve relationships in the family because part of it is that behavior mod like discipline and timeout. But the whole first end of parent child interaction therapy or similar models is relationship building. So just like what we talked about a minute ago, you like someone, you want to please them. Like when the kid came for testing, you know, not to say he doesn't like his, his caregiver, but when you build up that relationship more and more and more, um, then kids are more likely to comply with the rest of the discipline stuff. We did recommend psychiatric or at the least PCP evaluation, um, partly to get that doctor's note for possible OHI or 504, but, um, Partly because um, in kids with such complex presentations that aren't just like just ADHD or things like that with post-traumatic stress, it's really sometimes helpful to have like a child psychiatrist who specializes in these things. Um, now, at a school, you would never say that, please go to the psychiatrist and get medicine, right? But, you know, we'll see what the psychiatrists think. There is a big argument in the literature right now about whether kids with PTSD are over-medicated for ADHD, um, some people are like, oh, well, it's not really ADHD, so they shouldn't get that medicine. But like, if their brains look the same, there's the argument that, well, it's helping them control those behaviors in the same way so that they can, you know, benefit from other interventions. So I don't know, you be the judge. Well, the psychiatrist will be the judge, but um, definitely kids are over-prescribed other things like antipsychotics. But as far as ADHD medicine and, and kids in, in foster care or kids with post-traumatic stress, there's kind of a debate of like, is it a good or bad thing? And again, once these symptoms kind of disappear with a period of stability, maybe they don't need the medicine anymore. I don't know. Well, it doesn't matter to us. We don't have to make that decision, right? We're, that's why we work in a school. Okay. What about these cases that are mostly about COVID? So I just walked you through one that was more, um, just 
I want to say run of the mill trauma, which is sad, but maltreatment based, right? Which is probably one of the most common. What about COVID? So we, as Dr. Jeremy and Dr. Oganowski are telling people as well, we are recommending that everyone be assessed for trauma using this UCLA um, specific COVID measure. Uh, well, not everyone, I'm sorry, that was a mistake. Everyone who has been referred for emotional or behavioral disorder, right? So you're already kind of screening this. But for the time being, remember that with the UCLA as well, just having a high score on that doesn't rule in or out disability conditions. You can have nothing. You could have just some stress symptoms on there, but no disability. You can have both. You can have no stress symptoms and a disability. So let's go through a couple quick scenarios of each of these. Oh, by the way, if again, if we see PTS or a disability, especially with COVID, you might have to decide like, is COVID itself stress exacerbating this? Is it unrelated? Or is there some kind of direct link of like, I don't want to say causing it, but COVID like really stirred something up in this child. With COVID, we have this kind of unique opportunity to look at the timeline, the before and after, and that can help us decide if both things seem to be present, the PTS and some kind of implication of su some suspicion of a disability. We have a nice timeline that we can say, like around March is when this started getting bad, right? So like what happened before then? So I talked to Dr. Sharmi the other day and, and she is kind of encouraging people when they're looking at the impact of COVID on some of these disability evaluation considerations, she, she encouraged people to ask two questions. So we're going to go with that, right? One, when was this child referred? March, May, August. Okay. Two, what is the history of the specific behaviors that led to the referral? So when you say go back and look at this child's history, you're not like going back and looking at every single thing, but look at these specific behaviors that are leading to this referral. Maybe they had different behaviors before and now like a totally different type. Um, like maybe they had anxiety before and now they're having externalizing behaviors. No, you're looking at like this referral, if they're referred for externalizing behaviors, you know, what is the history of that in the records before COVID? So we're looking at before and after. Let's look at three different examples. They're all completely made up because I haven't done this yet, but this is what I would recommend as we go. The first one is Sammy. She's a 10 year old girl in fifth grade. Let's say she was referred for concerns related to ADHD. Um, when she took the UCLA measure, she reported that she was quarantined and had a positive test for COVID. Um, her UCLA total score and far as symptoms was a six. So six is minimal PTSD, monitor education and periodic rescreening. Not a huge red flag, right? Well, when was she referred? February. Ooh, okay. So before COVID even happened, she was referred which means you're probably out of timeline, but okay, let's just pretend. Um, specific behaviors. Well, right now the parent, because she's been at home, is saying she's interrupting, she can't focus, and she's disorganized with her homeschool work. If we look back in records, interviews, everything that was part of the original, let's say, referral packet, the teacher was saying she was interrupting, talking a lot, not paying attention, and she also failed math. There's your impact. So answering these two questions, of course you're going to look at a ton more data from Riot, but let's say you have data that's supporting this kind of ADHD inattention type of concern. My guess is that her PTS symptoms at this time aren't huge, aren't a huge factor, but it, her report, her recommendations are going to be more about this inattention, maybe this disability condition, depending on what data you have. And in the report, maybe it would look like this. You can be very general, by the way, about this. You don't have to say she has PTSD or not and like all of these things and we're considering and oh my gosh, the exacerbation and maybe it's not that, but maybe we should consider it. You know, all these thoughts in your head, just keep it simple. This child experienced specific thing they endorsed in exposure, right? Extended quarantine due to COVID illness. She is not currently exhibiting symptoms characteristic of post-traumatic stress. Well, they're mild, so mild, but not, let's say, currently exhibiting clinically significant symptoms. But this information should still be taken into consideration when she returns to school. You can keep it that general. You know, you don't have to go into how they might take it into consideration. Let's leave that up to them, right? We know it's nice to have this information to be aware of it. Let's not recommend anything just yet specific, right? But it's a nice red flag for teachers of like, hey, this kid did experience this, so let's continue to monitor just like the um, 
The UCLA screener says, continue to monitor, provide education about this, rescreen if necessary. All right, another case, 16-year-old man, grade 10, David. I named this one after the No David books, if you're familiar. Um, also my dad's name, and he doesn't like those books because of that. He was referred also for concerns related to possible ADHD-like behaviors. He lost his uncle due to COVID, so maybe a little higher exposure. His UCLA total score, though, was only a 12 in terms of symptoms. Well, I say only a 12. This is that gray area where maybe further evaluate, definitely keep monitoring, suggest that maybe he gets a full-blown assessment for the PTSD-related behaviors, um, not at school necessarily, but maybe a, a referral out. But let's look at these two questions. When was he referred? Late May. Okay, COVID had already started. His uncle had already passed away. Right now they're saying he has some characteristics um, or symptoms consistent with depression. They're suspecting that maybe he's using substances like marijuana to cope. He's really irritable with his parents and he's not completing his schoolwork. So mom had referred saying she thinks he has ADHD because of not completing schoolwork. Well, when we look back in the records, he only had one referral for talking and that's pretty much it. Like his grades were okay. Um, he was completing work. So it looks like this is a COVID shift. Um, and some of these like depression and irritability could just be what we call normal bereavement in a teenage boy. Um, the loss of his uncle, right? So in this case, it looks like he's having some post-traumatic stress symptoms about the loss of his uncle, but m depending on the data, may not meet criteria for a disability condition. Um, you're probably going to refer out and just say, like, let's get this PTS stuff looked at first and this grief. And um, it doesn't look right now like he has ADHD because it's neurodevelopmental and it would have started much longer before. You know, maybe we're missing something, but in the records, it looks like there's a definite shift from before to after. And in the report, you might write something like this. Unexpected death of his uncle, again, very specific. The screening results from the UCL, he is currently exhibiting symptoms characteristic of post-traumatic stress. You can use those exact words related to this loss. We know it's related to this loss because he filled the thing out and said, this exposure is what's causing these symptoms for me. Um, though he doesn't currently appear to meet criteria for a disability condition under IDA, the information should be taken into consideration when he returns to school. I love that phrase. I'll tell you that Gail Sherman gave me that phrase, just take it into consideration. We used to say that in Memphis too, like just take it into consideration, provide some general information about trauma to the teachers, take it into consideration. This is how you become trauma informed. That awareness piece is huge. It's the first step. Teachers and parents should continue to monitor his symptoms and refer out for counseling to address them. That's what we just talked about, right? Um, okay, so that one was a little different. Now let's look at a similar case. Also referred for ADHD, also let's say lost an uncle due to COVID, same type of thing. His score was 16, so same range, mild. But look at these two questions. When was he referred? Oh, late May, same. And you might already be thinking, oh, same as the other one, right? Like, this is going to be a shift. He didn't have any symptoms before, now he suddenly has symptoms. But look at the specific behavior. So right now he has difficulty concentrating. He's not completing his schoolwork. He's failing multiple subjects from homeschool from the spring. And he's acting very hypervigilant, always on alert, right? Like his mom has noticed he's really keyed up. He can't sleep. We look at the pre-COVID records. Let's go digging, right? He was making C's and D's in most fifth grade subjects. His report card said he was overly active and had difficulty concentrating. It is possible that some of these kids had these vulnerabilities pre-existing but the symptoms weren't to the duration, frequency, intensity, severity. They weren't impacting as much and never led to a referral. But now that this loss from COVID has happened, this trauma, it has exacerbated the underlying vulnerability to, say, ADHD. So I might take this one as a little different from the other one. And depending on the data, he might have both PTSD and ADHD, and it might be exacerbating these conditions. Or, you know, ED also is something you consider. Um... So just a final couple of notes, right? When making these decisions, of course you don't become ADHD or ID or LD because of COVID. That's silly, they're neurodevelopmental disorders. ED might be a different story, right? Um, however, COVID stressors might exacerbate those underlying vulnerabilities and lead to now clinical levels of behaviors or symptoms. That was that last case we just looked at. You know, what if this kid has had this vulnerability and all of a sudden it's starting to show up because of this stress before he was sort of, you know, failing and not getting much help, but his parents and teachers didn't really 
you know, do anything about it. They thought, you know, he's just being lazy. And now COVID is really exacerbating this and that hypervigilance is showing like he's got some PTS stuff going on and maybe it's exacerbating it. So now you have to take it a little more closely into consideration. Um, of course, some of these kids are going to get referred. They have neither, right? But again, you always going to write like, take this unique exposure into account when, um, when he goes back to school. So in this report for this child, we talked about the child experienced the unexpected death, same as the other blurb. Current screening results, he is currently experiencing these symptoms. He's also exhibiting consistent with ADHD symptoms, um, or however you word that in your reports, uh, conditions like ADHD, which may have been exacerbated, you can say that phrase, during COVID by his post-traumatic stress. I always say may have in reports. I'm never, ever, ever saying this definitely caused this. Because again, it's mental health, it's psychology, We it's not a perfect science. This information should be taken into consideration. Again, continue to monitor his symptoms, refer out for counseling, just like the other one, in addition to any recommended school-based services. So if this kid has a disability condition, maybe he's eligible for other things like school-based counseling. You can have, by the way, like some external counseling going on and some school-based counseling, like maybe the school base is looking at more day-to-day -day issues, um, looking at social skills, and then the, the therapist on the outside is working on TFCBT, like trauma-specific, and I've coordinated with many school-based counselors to, to do that successfully, so that can work. Um, we're really nice, even though we're outside of the school, I promise. Final notes for you to remember, okay? What learning about trauma can do for you is it can enhance understanding of the kid in their context. Again, take it into consideration. It doesn't have to be a magical decision tree. I'm sorry I can't give you a flow chart, but it does enhance understanding of this child and their context, which we know is really important. It enhances your understanding of possible exacerbation of existing vulnerabilities. So the thing we just talked about, it could enhance understanding of that, you know, looking at them through that lens. How can we better understand how this kid is functioning? How can we kind of get inside their mind? Like what is going on with this kid, right? Which I think is why most of us got into this that puzzle piece, that whole problem solving, right? Um, it can definitely improve recommendations. Even if you write nothing else about PTS and the whole conclusion or whatever has nothing to do with your diagnostic or eligibility decision, definitely part of the recommendations. Always monitor, educate parents, educate teachers to become trauma-informed, um, give general information about the trauma the child has experienced. You're not spreading their business everywhere, but like some general information, you know? This kid has experienced some, a really hard home life, so... Um, maybe a teacher might want to know that. I know when I was a teacher teaching high school, um, I would have really wanted to know that. Not so that I could give them an easy A, but so that I could um, adjust, you know, my expectations, my adjust my, um, the way I communicate, maybe, maybe amplify my efforts to make a solid relationship with that student a little more to help motivate them, right? A lot of teachers, uh, most teachers go into it because they like kids, at least at first. <laughs> so they might be willing to do things like that. And trauma-informed care is becoming a huge thing, by the way. So teachers are getting, hopefully, some training in this. Um, it's not all our responsibility as the psychology professionals or the evaluation professionals on campus, but a lot of it is um, going to rest on us for individual kids. So the whole school is getting trained on this, hopefully. But as an individual, you want to go advocate for that kid when, when you're in the IEP meeting, when you're working with the teacher, like, hey, remember, this kid has this traumatic history. Um, how can that change how we respond to them? How can that change how we design their behavior plan, where we sit them in class, how the relationship goes, right? How we understand their interactions with peers and their their um, needs and how they're getting their needs met in bad ways so that we can help them do it in more appropriate ways. And then my final, um, my final piece of, I guess, advice is what trauma cannot do in an evaluation is relieve us of the responsibility of evaluating the child. Again, in Tennessee, we had lots of people saying, well, we can't evaluate because there's trauma and that just complicates the picture. That's ridiculous. That's like saying, like, we can't evaluate because the kid has diabetes. Okay, you still have to take that into consideration. We all have a brain. We're going to use it. We can all do it, right? It can't serve as a rule out. Trauma does not rule out disability conditions. It's part of it. It's part of it. It may exist independently. It may be exacerbating, but it doesn't rule anything out. There's nothing in IDEA that says trauma is a rule out. And it can't make decisions about eligibility for you. For example, we talked about, like, you know, we can't have a flow chart. We have some nice Venn diagrams and we have some gray area things that we can think about. And I'm sorry, it's not more um, strict and, and easy, but we have to make decisions 
of course, with our brain and with our knowledge. And the more information, the better. And we can't let it just make the decision like, well, trauma, that means no disability. Or, well, trauma, that means definitely they have ED, you know. So we want to be really careful to keep these things separate, but to also keep open to the possibility that they may be influencing each other, the disability and post-traumatic stress. And that is pretty much what we're going to talk about um, during the question and answer session afterwards. So if you have any questions or if you have any points of clarification, please throw them in the chat box and I will be on live in a little bit to answer those questions. Thank you so much. Um, again, I'm Julia Strait. Um, you can follow my professional Instagram at Dr. Julia TX, although I'm still learning how to use it. And I do have a psychology today blog about emotions, this emotional mind. And if you need to refer out for services or just need consultation or additional training, I do work at stepping stone therapy here in Webster by Costco. Um, well now I work from home <laughs> during the pandemic, but, um, we take kids of all ages, families, groups, everybody. And if we're not right for you, I have some other referrals as well that I'm happy to send along. In fact, I'm going to include in the paperwork for this, uh, in the handouts, um, a really nice list that the hope and healing center of Houston created of all the different mental health resources related to COVID and kind of general ones in the Houston area. Thank you so very much.